All right, it's time for another Mr. Hat Ranking. In this video, I will discuss my top 10 favorite horror movies of 1972, a year that has a lot of Italian films and giallo movies. Prior to my preparation for this video, I had seen about half a dozen movies from this year, and now I've seen 47. And in this video, I will not only give you my top 10 favorites, but also three honorable mentions, three dishonorable mentions, and at the very end, I will shout out some other movies that might be worth a watch. So let's jump into my first dishonorable mention, the only movie that I just hated. Maybe I was in a bad mood when I was watching it, but this is the only one that's like a one star or below on Letterboxd, and that is Deathline, aka Raw Meat. Watching this movie is the equivalent of having an itchy asshole. It's annoying and no one wants to see you pick it. Shots seem to just linger for hours, and the final chase through this tunnel is about as exciting as watching paint dry. It makes a lot of sense that this is from the same director of Poltergeist 3, given the repetitive nature of the dialogue in both movies. If you want to see some guy yelling a bunch of incoherent ramblings that kind of sound like he's saying, I am the law, for 15 minutes straight, this is the movie for you. The only slightly amusing aspect of this trek was Donald Pleasance, his character, playing this cranky detective always begging for tea. They throw in a quick cameo by Christopher Lee that just feels wasted and thrown in here last second just to throw in another big name. The effects are pretty disgusting in a good way, so that's the best quality of the film really. And there's a couple of decent gore shots, but not enough to redeem this movie. Second dishonorable mission will go to a movie that it seems like a lot of people love. I had no idea that th this movie was that loved by my subscribers, at least. Two people have mentioned it as their favorite movie of 1972. I watched it on YouTube and thought that it was just horrible. And that is Gargoyles. A movie that starts off like an okay father-daughter adventure movie, but then quickly turns into a bad, cheesy creature feature with effects that are just about as good as a high school play. I thought the dialogue from these gargoyles was just hokey as hell, and the acting from the protagonist to just be so lifeless. Half the action sequences in this movie are played in slow-mo, but it's not like good slow-mo, it was like done in post, so it's like really choppy and terrible looking. I have really nothing else to add here. There's nothing memorable about it. I'm just glad that it was only like an hour and 15 minutes long. And my final dishonorable mention will be an Edgar Allan Poe story that has a couple of titles. The Oval Portrait, aka One Minute Before Death. This is a boring period piece, haunted house slash like mental illness movie mixed with a tragic love story. The whole second act of the movie is a long flashback with some really odd flash edits. It's so melodramatic and the acting is not a bit captivating. The music of the movie is good. It fits the tone and setting of the film, so I'll give it that at least. This is another movie where women seem to just keep fainting from shock left and right. It's ridiculous, and the transparent ghost effects really just date this movie and don't look scary at all. All right, now let's jump into my top 10, starting with a movie that I just watched. It was my last movie I watched for 1972, and that is Ben, a heartwarming and also tragic tale of friendship between a young boy and a rodent. The young actor from Burnt Offerings is the lead character. He does a good job, and he plays this uh, multi-talented kid who unfortunately has like a heart disease and doesn't have a lot of friends. He's a pretty sympathetic character. He becomes friends with the rats because of how lonely he is, and he's trying to protect them from the police who are trying to hunt them down and kill them because these rats have already killed a couple of people, including one of their own, so now it's personal for the cops. And he doesn't know that the, the rats have killed anyone, or he doesn't believe that the rats he's friends with are the ones that are responsible for the deaths that he's hearing about. So he's trying to, you know, in his mind, do the right thing and protect them. I had a good chuckle at some of the attack sequences on the town, like at the spa, the rats just running around loose and the women freaking out. It's pretty comical. It's not scary at all. I'm not sure if that's what they were going for, if they meant for this to be kind of funny or if they were trying to be scary. 
it was just more funny and I had a good laugh at it. The police subplot was all right. I'm glad they didn't spend too much time with it because this movie at the end of the day is mainly just about Ben and his friendship with uh, the young kid. I would have liked to see some like chewed up corpses, just some, you know, aftermath gore and maybe see that bully kid get chewed up by the pack of rats uh, chasing him off. Like this could have been potentially like a bloody rat movie, but it's PG, so it's pretty tame. I thought the score was excellent and the climax in the sewers was pretty exciting. There's a lot of flamethrower action and I'm curious how they pulled this off without hurting any of these rats. Interesting fact, this movie has a song written for it and it's sang by a young Michael Jackson. Number nine, we'll go to a movie starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and that is Horror Express. An early 20th century ancient evil force body hopping movie on a train with Cushing and Lee, but their voices oddly dubbed. The look of the fossil creature they discover was kind of eerie and the glowing red eyes, while kind of cheesy, was also a bit creepy. The third act had a nice surprise I wasn't expecting. It's in the trailer though, so it's spoiled if you watch that, but it kind of reveals this other ability that this evil has, turning it into like a zombie picture of sorts. There's a little bit of nice gore during some like autopsy scenes, and I feel like this movie kind of missed an opportunity to make it a mystery in the second half when the characters are trying to figure out who the evil is possessing now. We as the audience know, because for some reason the guy has like, a, like monkey hand or something, like his hands all fucked up. Uh, but the other characters, they all don't know, but we do. So it, like, there's no mystery. And I feel like they could have made it like a whodunit almost in the second half. Like, all right, who's possessed now? The soundtrack has a lot of like whistling sounds, which was all right. I, you know, I get it because it's a train and they have like that whistle sound, but it just wasn't right for certain sequences, like the action fight sequences. It just didn't really fit. I don't like that they have Christopher Lee doing the opening narration, like, here's a story and I'm going to tell you what happened. So it just lets you know, like, okay, well, now we know Christopher Lee is going to survive whatever happens next. I thought the pace was good. The antagonist was unique and interesting and the uh, claustrophobic trapped uh, stuck on a train setting was perfect for this story. Number eight will go to a giallo known as Knife of Ice. An Umberto Lindsay giallo and arguably his best movie. While the writing does have some flaws, some conveniences, and cheating the audience in a couple of moments, it's still an engaging mystery. The twist reveal was kind of surprising. I did suspect that person at one point, but then the movie did a good job kind of pointing suspicion elsewhere. I thought the pacing was a tad slow, and I wish the kills would have been more on screen, but I guess they would have had to be extra creative with the camera work in order for the mystery to work. I thought this movie was a bit unique when it comes to giallo mysteries because the lead character is a mute and the open has a brutal kill of a bull. It looks like we're actually watching a real bull be killed. It, it didn't look fake. So that was kind of hard to watch. Number seven will go to Wes Craven's first horror film he ever made, and that is The Last House on the Left. This is one of the first rape revenge movies with a terrific climax and well-portrayed antagonist you can't wait to see get butchered. The only downfalls of the movie are its wacky music choices, its low rewatchability, and the doofus cops they throw in here that just add unwanted levity, like comedy that just I didn't care for. It just throws off the tone of the film because it's a pretty dark, disturbing movie until the cops show up. It's pretty gritty and graphic for the time it was released in America. Yeah, some of these Italian films are pretty graphic, but in America, like American horror movies weren't always like this graphic. And interesting fact, this movie was produced by Sean Cunningham, who would go on to direct Friday the 13th. It's a very low budget movie and that shows on screen, but they make the most with what they got and it's not too stagnant. Number six goes to a movie I recently reviewed for a patron and that is My Dear Killer. 
a Giada with a hilarious open kill where a dredge claw picks up and decapitates a man. Like a standard Giallo movie, this has the obligatory nudity, POV, the black gloved killer stalking the victims, calling them, and then hanging up when they pick up. It's got all the things you want in a Giallo. I wish the climax would have played out differently. It kind of just fizzles out. They just reveal the killer and then it's like, all right, it's over. There's no like final fight, chase, nothing. There's a pretty cool mini like circular saw, electric saw kill in the middle of the movie that was pretty cool. And I thought the pacing was fine. The mystery was captivating. But like I said, it just needed a better payoff at the very end. Number five, we'll go to a British movie called Whoever Slew Auntie Roo. This is a British period piece set during Christmas that plays out like a Gretel and Hansel fairy tale starring Shelley Winters. The acting from the children is a bit rough at times, but Shelley Winters playing Auntie Rue does an excellent job. The open of the movie was pretty disturbing. Uh, it's atmospheric. Uh, the set designs are a bit creepy. I feel like the magician Shed should have played a bigger part in the story. I felt like they were setting something up in there, and then there was never a payoff later. They show this shed of like cool scary costumes and a real guillotine that never pays off later. I feel like they could have thrown in an extra kill or two with Auntie Rue's like maids and butlers especially when she finds out that some of them are like tricking her and stealing from her. I thought the movie moved along pretty good it just could have used more suspense and I th think it could have been darker. I do love though that we see Auntie Rue playing with her like dead child's corpse from time to time, like she's still alive. I thought that was pretty haunting. Number four will go to another giallo that I've reviewed on this channel a few months back, and that is The Red Queen Kills Seven Times. A giallo with gothic horror atmosphere, vicious kills, an interesting cursed legend, but a convoluted plot. The score is incredibly catchy, one of my favorites and the twist was unexpected. There's an unnecessary rape scene thrown in the middle that's like edited weird that I wish they just would have taken out and that character who does that, he doesn't really seem all that important. I just was really confused about that character and there's some pacing issues in the middle. This has the actress Barbara Boucher, Bouchet, however you pronounce it, from Don't Torture a Duckling. Uh, there's lots of nudity, the acting was average. Some of the stabbing effects on screen were a bit shoddy, not too convincing, but I do like the look of the killer with the cape, the long black hair, and the way the killer laughs like right after each kill. I thought it was pretty creepy. Number three will go to What Have You Done to Solange? A dark twisted engaging mystery with brutal vagina stabbings and lots of nudity. Camille Keaton plays the character Solange, and it's a character that's not mentioned or seen until like over an hour into the movie. It kind of pulls like a psycho where they kill off a character who you thought was more important and going to stick around for much longer. It's one of a couple Giallo movies that has like this in inexplicable like supernatural psychic element thrown in that's just convenient and never explained like how this person became so like clairvoyant. Ennio Morricone does the score and it sounds really beautiful. One thing this movie teaches me is that German wives are very forgiving of cheating husbands. The script is pretty well written. It marks a lot of characters as red herrings. It keeps you guessing and who it ends up being I never really suspected. Showing the parents of a deceased victim the x-ray of their vagina with a knife stabbed through it seems pretty inappropriate and unnecessary. Like, would they actually do that and why? I don't even understand why the x-ray was taken in the first place. Why would that be necessary? We know how she died. Why do we need to take an x-ray of the knife still in her vagina and then show that x-ray to the parents? Did they ask, hey, how did she die? Can we see a picture? It's a pretty dark fucked up mystery. So if you like that kind of movie, this is for you. And shout out, to Mikey, who chose this as his favorite of 72. Number two will go to Brian De Palma's Sisters. A very smartly written and well shot De Palma film with a twist I did not see coming. The performances in this movie are absolutely terrific and so is the score by Bernard Herrmann, composer of Psycho. And kind of like Psycho, the first kill of this movie is brutal and shocking because they kind of make you think this person's gonna be in the movie longer. 
This has some of that split screen editing that De Palma is famous for using like in Carrie, but the way he uses it in this movie I thought was done brilliantly. I just wish the climax at the clinic could have been a little bit more exciting rather than just be like a long exposition dump and confusing flashbacks. I really enjoyed the lead character in this movie. I loved her attitude, her determination, and you know, she's this independent woman who's writing these like controversial news columns that are pissing off the local cops. I just thought she was a really good written character. And shout out to user with a name I'm probably going to butcher, but... It's probably not even your real name. Who knows? Dustin Drot Walk. Shout out to you. You know who you are. Who chose this as their favorite of 1972. Now, before we get to my number one, let's go over three honorable mentions that just missed the list. Starting first with Tales from the Crypt. A cheesy but somewhat dark anthology with five short stories and only one being lackluster. You have Peter Cushing starring in this, playing this warm, giving, elderly man who is unfairly treated and bullied into suicide. Two segments in this are holiday-themed, and it kind of makes you wonder why they didn't do that for the rest of them. The opening credits are over day shots of a cemetery, and it's, it goes on for too long, and I think it would have been better if it was nighttime with maybe some fog to better serve the scene and create better atmosphere. The fate of the bankrupted husband is the worst thing I can imagine happening to anyone. And the blind segment is the longest one, and it feels the longest, and it could have been tightened. I also feel like the the whole wraparound, it's obvious what's happening, and it's just not necessary. And I feel like that's true for most anthologies, wraparounds. You just don't really need them. Let's just watch the segments. My second honorable mission will go to another giallo, and that is Death Walks at Midnight. A sort of sequel in title only to Death Walks on High Heels with the same director and lead actors. It's yet another giallo where the main character has like a supernatural, like psychic vision of a murder as it's happening, kind of like what have you done to Solange. But this one makes a little bit more sense why she's having this vision, because she's like under the influence of some like experimental hallucinogenic. I did find the plot of this movie a bit hard to follow at times, and some things still seemed unclear to me even after the whole let me tell you why I'm doing this speech from the killer at the end. I liked the murder weapon in this movie that's on the posters, that's an iron fist with spikes, but unfortunately it's only used once really. I feel like one thing they should have done in this movie is make it to where you didn't know if you could trust the lead character. Like, make her a red herring. You know, like, did she take this experimental drug and now she's snapped and she's the killer? I don't ever feel like that's part of the mystery. They just point to other people and they never really make you suspect the main character. Like, I feel like the mystery could have played a lot better if they made you not even trust the lead character. Last honorable mention will go to the first Herschel Gordon Lewis film I've ever seen, and that is The Gore Gore Girls. This is an ultra-gory, mean-spirited, murder mystery comedy with a lead actor who really carries this film. The dynamic between the reporter lady and the private detective kind of reminds me of the main two characters in Deep Red in a way. And I like the role reversal here, where it's the reporter lady who's like constantly trying to get the private detective, this guy, to like make out with her or, you know, have sex, but he's just constantly like ignoring her and just more focused on the mystery. And the guy playing this detective is easily the best actor in the movie. He is Oscar worthy compared to the other dreadful actors in this. The humor in this film is very hit and miss. There's a lot of fourth wall breaking and I feel like way too much time is ate up by sequences of strippers dancing on stage. The audio gets muffled at times. There's some out of focus shots. The movie ultimately suffers from its low budget. There's just a lack of coverage, some bad edits here and there. It's really the kills and the gore that made this movie so fun for me to watch. It's just so over the top brutal. An ass getting beat with a like meat tenderizer. You see a woman's nipple get sliced off and then like milk shoot out. It's over the top. I did find that the killer became much more obvious by the third act, but I liked a couple of the interesting wacky red herrings they threw in here. 
like the war vet who likes to draw faces on melons and then squish them. And funny enough, the motivation in this movie from the killer is the same exact like motivation that is in another movie from the same year and then another movie from the 80s. Number one, we'll go to a movie that I've reviewed already, and it's, of course, another giallo being mentioned on this list, and that is Don't Torture a Duckling. My favorite Fulci movie and second favorite giallo where kids are being murdered, which is probably why I love it so much. The music in this movie was done by the same composer who did Cannibal Holocaust, I believe, and it's a bit of a mixed bag for me. There's one cue that's overused, and it was like later kind of recreated for James Wan's Malignant. It's very similar sounding to that, but the rest of the music I thought was solid. The performances for the most part are good, with the voodoo lady kind of being the slight exception. She has a couple of moments where she gets a little too theatrical. I think it's cleverly written, has a steady pace, and a bloody, gruesome finale that's unintentionally funny. And you get to see Barbara B. naked. I'm just, I'm just going to call her Barbara B. because I have no idea how to say her last name. But I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. You get to see her naked quite a bit in this. And shout out to T.O. Martin, who chose this as his favorite of 1972. Now, before I go, I'll leave you with some more movies that might be worth checking out from this year. And first up will be The Case of the Bloody Iris. A high-rise apartment populated by models, nightclub dancers, and call girls becomes the focus of a mysterious serial killer. Your vice is a locked room and only I have the key. Alaviro is a drunk, burnout writer who amuses himself by hosting orgies at his grand country manor. And when a number of women are murdered in grisly fashion, he becomes a prime suspect. When Michael calls, a woman begins to receive ominous phone calls from her nephew who died 15 years earlier. With each phone call, a family member dies. Will she be the next in line? The Blood Spattered Bride A young newlywed begins to have disturbing nightmares just after settling into the old mansion that has belonged to her husband's family for centuries. When her sinister dreams come true, the innocent bride is caught in a maddening maze of unspeakable horrors. Barren Blood. A young man Peter returns to Austria in search of his heritage. Peter reads aloud the incantation that causes Barren Blood to return and continue his murderous tortures. The Night Stalker. Wise Kraken reporter Carl Kolchak investigates a string of gruesome murders in Las Vegas. It seems that each victim has been bitten in the neck and drained of all their blood. And Kolchak is sure that it is a vampire. Dr. Fibes rises again. The vengeful doctor rises again, seeking the scrolls of life in an attempt to resurrect his deceased wife. The Thing with Two Heads. A rich but racist man is dying and hatches an elaborate scheme for transplanting his head onto another man's body. His health deteriorates rapidly, and doctors are forced to transplant his head onto the only available candidate, a black man from death row. Silent Night, Bloody Night. An axe killer stalks a lawyer and his girlfriend in a house that used to be an asylum. Tower of Evil. A group of experienced archaeologists are searching for an old and mystic Phoenician treasure when they are surprised by a series of mysterious murders. And so there you have it. That is my top 10 favorite horror movies of 1972. I will list all the other movies I did not mention here in the info box below. So yeah, check that out in case you're curious what I've seen. And... Also, let me know what your top 10 favorite movies are of 1972 in the comments below. And as always, if you like what you've seen here, you can hit this like button and become a subscriber today just by clicking on my cartoon face in about five seconds. And remember, it's all an opinion. You don't need to get butthurt about it. <laughs>